and we will get started. Um, any questions on anything in the past or quizzes or any assignments or anything we've done before we move forward? Okay, that was easy. All right, I am going to share my screen as we look at where we are right now and what's coming forward. All right, so um, last week um, we did the assignment. I haven't even looked at it. It's reflection three. Um, as I said, there was a minimum, I think, of 250 words, which to me was very simple. Um, if it's not even 250 words, just so you know right now, I'm not even going to look at it. If you didn't do those three minimum things, I talked about that in class and in the recording. Um, it did require you to do some research, which I explained. Um, and so, again, if you didn't do all of those minimums, unfortunately, I'm not even going to go through and grade it and take my time because you have to at least have done by week seven where we were at those minimums. I'm looking forward to grading it um, because, again, we are at this point at that court time for you to be the judge and to step into that position and to begin doing that research um, into making those decisions. Um, all right, there was also an optional extra credit. That's where I thought, hey, how are we going to do this class? We were going to meet and kind of do some groups. And I thought, you know what, this is the time I want you to really apply what you've learned. Um, so this is the time where I hope you were able to actually really go in and under the gun with a timed quiz, really look at these cases and do some research and get some extra credit though. Um, so hopefully there wasn't too much pressure where you were going to be, have a score count against you, but you'd have a chance to get some extra credit, um, but also be, like I said, under the gun where the timing was against you. So you really had to look and utilize what we learned on um, Tuesday, what you've learned in your textbook, and then have the availability to do some research to review those cases. All right, we are now going into our final um, C, which we've covered COPS, we've covered courts, and now we are going into corrections. Um, so this is going to be where we are chapter eight in your textbook. And we're gonna be covering chapter eight with our PowerPoint, which I've made that visible as well. Um, you are taking quiz four this week, and there is a journal. I'm going to click on that. The journal is from um, chapter nine in your textbook, which is kind of over community corrections. Um, I copy and pasted from chapter 9.1 to the blue box, where you're going to kind of add answer three questions that kind of goes over, you know, why do we have so many people in jails and prisons and what are some of the issues we're facing and what's been our approach to solve it, what's what's worked, what hasn't. So that's pretty much what the journal's about. Um, are there any questions um, on this? I, um, I know, I don't know if you've looked at it yet. If you haven't looked at that, um, just to review with you again, um, if you go to the very top of Moodle, I have listed my Zoom office hours, um, which are Mondays and Tuesdays and Thursdays. All you have to do is just send me an email and we can Zoom or send me an email with your phone number. If these aren't good times because you have another class, or because you work or something, just send me an email and we can set up another time or you wanna do it on the weekends, whenever you wanna do it, um, just let me know. We can go ahead and meet. All right, any questions about what's going on this week or with the assignments? All right, easy peasy. All right, so let me make sure our PowerPoint's ready to go. If you wanna follow along, like I said, um, you guys have that link and let me share my screen. All 
All right, so this is chapter eight. And again, this is the start of our final C, which is on corrections. And I have to say there's a lot of kind of misunderstanding in corrections. You really hear in the news a lot about um, cops because you know that kind of gets all the stories when somebody gets arrested and things that happen, especially with police use of force, police shootings, with what's going on in the news right now. You kind of hear a lot with trials, especially with celebrity trials. Um, you don't hear a lot with prisons. Ever so often, there'll be shows that come out, you know, the new Orange, the Black, a lot with the fictional shows, but not a whole, whole lot. All right, so we're going to kind of start out with careers. It's kind of the all too forgotten careers. It used to be before you could actually become a cop, you had to be a correctional officer. Now we're gonna talk about prison careers in a minute because there is a difference between a prison and a correctional facility. Um, a lot of times they get lumped together, but there is a difference. Um, so they're not the same. They're very, very different in a number of different respects and you're gonna need to understand the difference. Um, but we're gonna start talking about careers because really they're forgotten and I wish this class I wish we met because I always have guest speakers come in and they're amazing they come in from Jackson County Sheriff's um, Department and we have actually um, Deputy Kokemo come in and he actually wanted to be a deputy he wanted to actually be out on the street and he actually comes in and he talks to students and he says you know I wanted to be a deputy I had no experience and I was testing to be a deputy and the correctional position came open at the sheriff's department. And so I tested for that as well. And I actually got hired for the correctional facility first. And he goes, we make like 50 cents less than less an hour. So it's pretty much the same pay. We have the same retirement. Um, our academy is half as long because we don't go out on the street. So we don't have to learn as much. And my backup is seconds away. Whereas if you're on patrol, your backup is minutes away or more. And he goes, and I get to really know the people I work with, you know, because they're there, they're the same people I'm working with them. They're not long-term because I'm not working in a prison with people that are there long-term on felonies, you know, so um, it's more newer people that I'm seeing but I love my job and there's a lot of rehabilitation involved and we're doing a lot of new things. And so he ended up staying and he's been there over a decade and he loves it. So it's kind of the often forgotten career. And what's new about it is a lot of police departments are now actually saying, you know what, um, be, because we feel being a cop is so important and because it's such a tough career and because so many cops communication is so important and they can't do it. The way we find out if they can is through a very controlled environment. And because being a correctional officer is so controlled, it's at a correctional facility, they're not out in the field and it's filmed, it's filmed and we can watch them a lot of departments you have to now be a correctional officer for two years before you can even test to be a cop so i think that's kind of cool actually so before you can go out and be on your own and even put yourself in a situation where you could use force or actually get in a bad situation you have to be a correctional officer first so i like to cover correctional careers and under that is kind of probation officers and that's another forgotten career i so often have people come to me and go hey what career should i go into and i'm like have you ever thought about being a probation officer it's actually a career that you have to have a bachelor's degree for it pays a lot of money and actually locally you can be you can work in jackson county and you don't have to carry a gun you can be a probation officer in jackson county i actually sit on their oral boards um, on their panel testing for them um, for their supervisors and their probation officers and you can either choose to carry a gun or not carry a gun it's a choice and then they have juvenile probation officers and then they have adult probation officers and it's with the community justice department and they're very focused on 
um, rehabilitation. So it's just really, really cool. All right, so again, we have the, it used to be that you had probation officers and parole and it's combined. It's a whole combined thing. And like I said, they call them um, community justice because they're more seen as clients um, and they're working under um, a rehabilitation umbrella that we call it. And then you have correction or detention officers. So again, it's not seen as a prison. It's a correction or detention facility, and it's more seen as short term. So make sure you really understand that about corrections. And then we have juvenile detention officers. So those are separate. Unless you have a really small city or a small county, there are two different umbrellas. So even where we live in, if you live locally in Jackson County and in Medford or Central Point or Talent or Ashland, there is a juvenile detention officers and there's adult. It is totally separate. And then there's federal correction officers. So again, just like we have federal agents that we talked about with officers, law enforcement officers, and then you have your city municipal officers, there are federal correctional officers. All right, so just like I said, probation and parole officers, um, they work under county, state, and federal agencies. Um, they make reports to court on offender behavior. So. To give you an example of this, and again, I really want you to make sure you understand this. So let's say that I was um, out, I went out this evening at 2 a.m. and I bought some heroin and um, my, I was 25 years old and my parents kicked me out and I had nowhere to live and I got fired from my job. And so I was, I didn't have any money. And so I broke into a house and I stole money. And then I bought some more heroin and I broke into another house and I was breaking into some cars and the cops arrested me. And um, I, the judge let me out on my own recognizance because it was my first arrest. Well, a probation officer is going to see me and they're going to write a report to the court because the judge doesn't know who I am and the judge doesn't have time to do this. So the probation officer is going to meet with me. They're going to look at me and their main goal, especially in Jackson County, like I said, remember, they see me as a client. Their main goal is not to put me into jail. Their main goal here is what can they do for Tiffany? to rehabilitate me, to get me on my own feet. And so they're going to look at restorative justice. What can they do to get me on my feet, to help me? Am I addicted to drugs? They're gonna find out, do I need to be in a drug rehabilitation program? Um, do I need to be in jail or don't I? They're gonna make a recommendation to the court um, and probably since I haven't been arrested before, they're going to say, no, Tiffany doesn't need to be in jail. Tiffany, um, she's on heroin. It's very addictive. Um, she probably does need to go see a drug counselor to find out that, hey, heroin is addictive. She needs to see somebody about getting a job because she was just fired. So they're going to be making those recommendations to the court because the judge doesn't have time. And the judge is going to look at those recommendations. Um, they're making those pretrial investigations for the court. They're kind of like, the detective for the court. And then they're going to make sure with whatever they tell the court to do, the judge obviously, just like you guys were the judge for last week's assignment, the judge makes the discretion and makes the decision. However, the, the probation officer, I'm the client, and that probation officer is going to make sure that whatever the judge tells me to do, that I'm in compliance. So if the judge says, hey, the probation officer told you to go meet with um, the drug court, to listen to what they say, and to go apply to this job, this job, and this job. And so the probation officer is gonna make sure that I check in and that I do those things. If I don't do those things though, you know, I'm gonna have to go tell the judge why I didn't do those things. And then they're gonna complete an offender risk assessment. So there's gonna be certain things that like, for example, um, I didn't have a place to live. So they may recommend that I live at a certain place and they may say, you know, 
we don't want her going back to that to live with her parents because there's some family members there that are using drugs and that's high risk. So there's going to be certain things that happen. And I may say, I'm back living at that house. And they may say, that's not good because that's high risk tipping. That's why you started using the heroin in the first place. So does that make sense? And then again, if I move back to that house and I'm not checking in and applying for those jobs, they're going to tell the court that I'm not doing those things and I'm behaving in those high risk behaviors. All right, so parole officers are a little bit different than probation. So does anybody want to tell me, does anybody know the difference between a probation officer and a parole officer? Like I said, a lot of times they're the same person, but what is the difference between being on probation and being on parole? Um, is parole when you just got out of jail and then probation is before you've been to jail? So good. So very good. So that this is kind of what we're going to talk about, the difference between jail and prison. So yes. So parole is, I am, I just committed, just kind of like me, let's say that the judge, um, I, it was my fifth burglary and they said, Tiffany, we've already given you four chances. We're going to give you, and this is a felony, you're going to go away for a year. So I went to prison, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. We haven't gone there yet, but we're going to talk about prison. And then I got out. So now that probation officer becomes my parole officer, because now, even though I didn't do a year in prison, I had really good behavior. They let me out early. I'm on parole. What that basically means is, and we're going to go over this a couple of times, but what that basically means is I didn't do my whole year because I had good behavior. Is that if I don't, again, follow what the court says, they could revoke my parole and put me back in because I had a year sentence in prison. They let me out early because I did really good. However, if I, again, don't get a job and I start using drugs again, or I break the law again, they can pull that parole away and make me serve my original sentence. Does that make sense, guys? Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, good. All right, so good job. So their job, parole officers, again, is I'm not in, I'm not in prison. I'm not serving my original sentence. So they're just making sure that whatever the parole board is that let me out early, whatever they tell me to do, that I'm just doing it. Um, all right, we covered all that. They're visiting, um, they're making visits to make sure again that I'm doing all that I'm supposed to do. Okay, correction and detention officers. Um, I kind of went over what they do. And like I said, a lot of people love doing it because it's actually an, a cool job. You make almost the same money as a cop on the street and you're a lot safer. Um, some still want to go out on the street because it's got more of that excitement where you get to run code in a car. But other people are like, you know, you also, it's a lot more dangerous and I don't want to risk my life. All right, so correction and detention. You are working at what we call more of a short term jail or detention center. So when I was on the street and I arrested somebody, didn't matter what I arrested him for. It could be for stealing something. It could have been for a robbery. It could be for anything. I took, I just arrested him. It didn't mean I found them guilty. It just meant that I was arresting them. And you remember, we went over, they still had, they still got to go through all, they still got to put up bail. They still got to plead not guilty. They still had to get their day in court or, you know, whatever. They still got to go through their day in court, all that. But when they first went to jail and got through the booking process, they went to jail, not to prison. They went to jail or they went to the detention center. So, and that is your corrections or detention officers down. That's who books you in. Um, and so that's what we're talking about. You don't go to prison until you've been through the whole system like we talked about and you're found guilty and you're sentenced 
or you plead guilty and you do a plea bargain and you're sentenced, that's when you go to prison. And that's only for a felony. If you plead guilty to a misdemeanor and a judge sentences you to 30 days or 60 days or anything less than a year, you don't go to prison. You just stay in jail, which is a correction or detention facility. The only people that go to prison are people that are found guilty of felonies. So does that make sense to anybody? Any questions on prison and the difference between a jail and a prison? Because we're going to get into a question later on that you guys are going to need to make sure you understand that difference. Okay. So correction and detention officers maintain security and transportation. For example, um, some smaller um, detention centers, they're at the same place where the judge is. So they can actually just walk you right over to where the judge is. A lot of places now do it by video, so it's easy. Some even have like an underground tunnel where you walk over. Um, but some, they actually take people by van. Um, that has kind of gone away a lot because there was a lot of escapes. And like you see in the movies, that's how people used to escape because they do it a lot by video now. Um, but it used to be transport. The correction detention officers or even some of the marshals would get the people that had to go over and see the judge every day because they were arrested the night before. So they had to go see the judge for bail um, within a timely fashion because we just can't keep you in jail all the time. You have to see the judge and make your plea so you can get get out and go see, you know, a lawyer so you can make your plea just like we learned last week. Um, they would take you in transportation. That really, like I said, doesn't happen anymore. A lot of it goes by video. Um, we work with adults and juveniles, although they're separated in different buildings most of the time. Um, correction and detentions. Whenever an officer books somebody, they get fingerprinted, photographed. That's where you see the famous booking photographs of, I normally say, um, celebrities, because normally you don't see everybody. Um, but that's where you see that booking photograph. And then they manage offenders in the correctional facilities and respond to emergency specialized units. So what do correctional salaries? It's anywhere between 30 and $75,000, just depending where they work. It's kind of what we call parity. And what that means is your unions. What, what happens is a union for a law enforcement agency or correctional um, facility agency will say, hey, we're in Oregon, we work in this area. You can't pay the this agency more than that agency because everybody will want to go work for that agency because they pay so much more money. So we we want parity. So that's how you'll find that most agencies in a certain area generally make the same amount. It's because their unions have fought for them to make that amount. And it generally has to do with cost of living and things like that. All right, so now we're kind of on to prisons. So there's a little YouTube here that I've posted. Um, you're more than welcome to go watch it. And it's actually a good video that goes into explaining um, if you're kind of like, I still don't really get it, you know, what is the difference between a prison guard and a correctional officer? Um, this really is a really good video on YouTube that really does go into explaining the difference between a prison guard versus a correctional officer. So again, a prison guard is more of a uniformed jail or prison employee whose primary job is the security and movement of inmates. And the best way I can explain it is when people go away to prison, and I'm sure you've seen a movie of it, prison, prisoners are there, some are there for life. Um, some have committed felonies and they've been sentenced to life in prison. Some are there, they've been sentenced to 10 years, 20 years, 25 years. Um, so it is, their home um, and people know them. So it is a different type of environment, as you can imagine, than a correctional facility where somebody just gets there, they're being booked in or they've never been booked um, or somebody is just there for three days or five days or there's different areas. So it's a very, very, very 
different environment for many, many, many different reasons. I highly recommend, um, right now, obviously it isn't happening, but you know, once COVID, you know, I'm hoping obviously that the COVID, we will get this under control. Um, Dr. Carter does, I think it's twice a year, once in February, and I think it's once in May, goes over to the Pelican Bay um, prison and they do a um, field trip over there where you get to tour the facility. I had never, and I had been a cop and everybody's like, how were you a cop for 20 years and you'd never been over through a prison? And like I say, remember, we're all separate. You have cops, you have courts, you have corrections. We're separate for a reason. Um, I'd never toured a prison. And um, I got to, when I first came here, I went over and toured Pelican Bay. And it's just amazing. Um, they really do give you a for, first class tour. You get to talk to the prisoners. Um, you put on a bulletproof vest. You get to talk to the guards. You get to see things they've collected. You get to see things they've made. You get to talk to some of the guards on some of the issues they have and how they get phones and and drugs still into the prison. And it's just really amazing. And you really get to see, I got to see really the difference. It really opened my eyes because I've been in a correctional facility many times because I was a law enforcement officer. Um, but you really, I highly recommend if you haven't done it, it's free. They, you guys carpool over there. I know Dr. Carter drives and then they normally have one student drive. So you carpool, it's free. So I highly recommend if you're interested, send Dr. Carter an email. He'll keep you on the list if you're interested in going. It is just very eye-opening on a number of different reasons to see what a prison is like um, on just on so many, so many levels. So anyhow, all right, um, warden, you need to know what a warden is. The warden is the chief administrator of the prison. So it's the main person who is running the prison. All right, so now that we've kind of looked at corrections, um, we've looked at what a correctional officer is, the difference between a jail and a prison. Now we're gonna go back historically and um, look at what jails used to be like. And we're not going back real, real far, but we are gonna go back and, and look at them just a little bit. Um, historically. So, and it's just like everything looking back, it, it's not a fun thing to look at um, because it, it wasn't a nice thing. Um, early jail conditions um, used to be that prisoners um, were required to provide their own food and medical needs. Well, you ask, how did they do that? Well, they had to have somebody on the outside bring them um, money or bring them food. Um, instead of having one person in a 12 by 12 cell, they put 16 people in a 12 by 12 cell. Men, women, and children were all housed together. Um, it meant sick and healthy were housed together. So you can imagine what, what happened. So disease just spread. There was no heat, no plumbing. Um, so you can imagine when people were going to the bathroom, that just spread diseases. So many people died just from sickness and starvation and disease. It was just awful. Um, yes, that is me in the bottom right of your screen. Um, this was actually in 2018. This is the Clink Prison in London. This is another thing I recommend if you're a CCJ major or if you're not, this is a class you can actually take. Unfortunately, you can't take it now, but I highly recommend next year. This is a class that Dr. Allison Burke, who is um, right here, if you can see my mouse, um, she teaches it. She goes over, gosh, um, you take it, the class in the winter, you meet once every Friday, and then she teaches a different location every year. So she's gone to London, she's gone to Italy, she's gone to Ireland, and you focus on the criminal justice system in a different country. And I went with her one year when they went over to London and Paris, 
and this is where we went to the Plink prison. And it was really hard to see because um, it was one of the prisons that had some of the most unimaginable torture going on in it. And it operated basically from the 12th century and it closed in the 1780s. And it was called the Clink Prison, they think because people wearing chains and then they walked around and it clinked. Um, but it just, they didn't let us take any pictures inside. Otherwise I'd show you some of the pictures. Um, so we just kind of all took a picture outside. So what happens is you, you sign up for the class, you get credit for it. Um, like I said, in the winter, you take it every Friday and you do um, basically everywhere we go or wherever you're going to go that year, um, you do some research on and then during spring break, you head over to wherever you're going that year. So it's pretty cool what you get to see. Um, and, you know, this was just so sad to see what people went through um and the torture that they went through and they actually had the um the devices uh that they had people wear and the iron that people had to wear and the brutality uh, it was just people they put they made them stay up all night and wear different devices and people left the prison um paralyzed because and just for simple things like they didn't pay their rent so it was pretty amazing um looking back historically the different types of prisons there were um there was um the walnut street jail this was the beginning of the reforms and this was in 1790 um a law was passed so like i kind of tried to do it historically this was in the clink prison closed in 1780s and in pennsylvania um, the Walnut Street Jail in 1790 passed a law that required humane physical facilities. And so you wonder if this kind of happened because of the Clink Prison that said, hey, you have to have adequate food and water at the public expense. You can't make the prisoners pay for it. And you have to have a separation of men, women, and children. You can't put them all together. And you can't buy better treatment if you're a prisoner. And debtors and the mentally ill um, have to be separated from the criminal population. And again, this is something you need to know. Um, this will be on the quiz as well. Also, orphans were moved to separate buildings um, because the orphans used to be kept in the jail area. All right, another reform came out called the Auburn system, and it was built in 1816. It was a walled maximum security. They used corporal punishment, marched everywhere, made them have short haircuts. The cells were poorly lit with no fresh air. And it was actually the prototype for the American prison. Then there was the Eastern State Penitentiary. It was built in 1829. It cost 500,000 to house 250 prisoners. And this is back in 1829. It was the most expensive building in the new world. It was the first in the country to have flushing toilets and hot air heating. And it was designed as a penitentiary, not as a jail or prison. And the, the penitentiary basically is a correctional institution based on the concept that inmates can change their criminality through reflection and penitence. All right, in the 1930s, laws prohibited the sale of inmate goods. And then prisons began supplying products to the government, such as license plates. And in between 1950 and 1966, there were over 100 riots in prisons. 
And in September 1971, 43 inmates died in the Attica State Prison Riot. And in February 1980, 36 died in New Mexico riots. In the 1980s, the US Supreme Court decided that inmates could sue over living conditions in the prisons, over not getting medical treatment in the prisons, over their rights in the prisons, and over prison policies. Go back there, sorry, I didn't know that moved. All right, so again, just to make sure you know how important this is, the difference between jails and prisons. So jail is a short-term multi-purpose holding facility that serves as a gateway for the criminal justice system. Jails hold defendants awaiting trial, defendants convicted of misdemeanors, the mentally ill pending movement to a health facility, and prison is for long-term physical confinement. And again, those who have convicted of felonies. All right, so we're gonna be discussing this a little more when we get into state prisons. So prisons are correctional institutions for prisoners convicted of felonies that have extended sentences, they're separated inmates by sex, and architecture reflective of gender bias. The 10 highest incarceration rates are as seen on the screen. State prison security levels. Minimum have few physical barriers to escape and have many programs for inmates. Medium security are fortress-like, walled, self-contained institutions that offer inmate education, vocation, and rehabilitation. Maximum security prisons are prisons for inmates at high risk of escape and who are dangerously violent to other inmates or staff. Administration segregation or solitary confinement and inmates are kept in a single cell 23 hours a day. They are allowed a shower and one hour of recreation per day. Private jails and prisons are for-profit facilities run by private security companies contracted by counties at a lower cost. They have less programs, less training, lower paying conditions, often below state standards. Escapes and assaults carry smaller penalties. Here's a photo that sh shows a share of inmates in private prisons by state in 2016. Your lightest color states have no private prisons. Your red states have greater than 30% private prisons. Your lighter red states have 20 to 29% private prisons. Your dark blue states have 10 to 19% private prisons. All right, so here comes a, some group work. Your thoughts, when I put you in a group, now that you know what a prison means, again, as a reminder, a prison is for people that are convicted through a court of law or that have pled guilty in a court of law to a felony and are serving time. Should a prison be run by the government or should prisons be run by a private business? Any questions before we get started?
Okay, one thing about groups, um, groups, this is a time, and I know it's easy during Zoom not to be, but this is a time you do need to talk. Um, so I don't want to have to come to your rooms and ask everybody if everybody's talking, but um, I am going to be one part of your grade, your participation grade is going to be um did you have a breakout room where nobody talked so i hate to ask you guys this but please know if you have a breakout room where somebody in your room did not talk because this is your time to note it so you are going to be filling out a survey where you get to note that so please don't go to your breakout room and not talk that's all i can ask um that is a part of participation folks so just remember that all right sending you to your breakout rooms. Everybody, so let's resume um, our talks on prisons, um, being run by the government or being privately run. Let's start with room number one. What was your group's um, overall thoughts? Oh, okay, I think we were group number one. Um, so we were a bit split down the middle. Um, some of us thought that basically private prisons should not really exist. Um, and then the other half of us kind of thought that there should be a mix of private and state. Um, and basically we were saying um, private prisons kind of might um, lack when it comes to inmate care and like putting effort into actually rehabilitating them. Um, because, you know, it's just cost more money to have those programs. And um, also they don't have to follow the state um, regulations and such. So the inmate care might not be um, as high. Okay. All right. Room two, what were your guys' thoughts? Okay, so we were room two and we pretty much um, all agreed that like, there's a lot of well sometimes there's a lot of distrust for like um government run things and but on the other hand we were worried about privately run prisons because of the lack of inmate care and um just worried that there might be some like s more sneaky people that like are trying to be more cost effective rather than actually care for the human lives and when it comes to like government run things you know they have to follow certain regulations and rules and everything has to be really like they have to be really on top of it but privately owned stuff can be a little bit like sketchy with that kind of stuff but on the other hand if you're more maybe optimistic about it um privately owned things could maybe take advantage of the um not having as many regulations and use their money for more like um, more education programs for prisoners and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so were you 50-50? I'm hearing 50-50. Yeah, so pretty 50 -50? split. Okay, 50-50. Okay, room three. So we all agreed on government run because, because of the regulations and they're probably more um, into both inmate and like employee safety rather than okay. just being money oriented, you know? Okay, all yeah. right. Room four. So I feel like we all had a preference toward government ran, but it is kind of hard because we felt like there needs to be a little bit of both because of checks and balances. And also I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure with private, they don't have to like report out on statistics and stuff. So that's why we were saying like kind of no to private because, you know, they don't talk about like how many people receive a day. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that's true. They just don't have all of those like very helpful statistics. And this can also lead to somewhat bad conditions for the prisoners to be in. So that was something that kind of made us say more no to that. Okay. All right. Room five. Um, well, we all agreed that it should be government run and because of like three different reasons we said that it becomes for profit so they can skimp on some of the more like the necessities like inmate care employee care and all of those things um, they it can reduce rehabilitation efforts and then three it's unethical because of prison labor it's like they could use that in a not so nice way okay all right um room six so my group all agreed on a government run 
uh, just because of the programs and they just we just thought that they'd do a lot better job. Okay, and room seven. Do we have room seven? I thought we had room seven. Maybe we didn't have room seven. Okay, all right, so um, there's a lot, you guys brought up all the key points that I wanted you to bring up. Um, and for those of you that are gonna go on to Dr. Carter, I'm not gonna bring this surprise for you. So, because he goes into a lot of that um, as far as private prisons and the chapter also goes into a lot of that. So once you hit the reading on that, um, a lot of your work is going to go into reasonings of government run and private prisons. And that is kind of the rub that we get into with the checks and balances. Um, with the issues that we're dealing with is, and a lot of the issues is that we are dealing with one system that we're trying to create for many different human beings. Let me ask you a question. Um, when you see all these shows, I had one student ask me one time, um, why do some prisons have like the pit bull program that you see on TV and some, pro some prisons don't? You know that pit bull program where some of the prisoners get to train a pit bull and have them sleep with them and some prisons don't. How does that work? Does anybody know? Is it because of funding? So you're, you're hitting right around it, Jade. You're kind of playing right around. So it's, it's kind of what I call, first of all, everything has to do with funding, okay? Everything has to do with money. I mean, that's what makes the world go around, number one. But what it takes is, um, it takes a lot of things, it takes a lot of the puzzle pieces to come together, what I call. So it takes the warden, is it a privately run, is it a government run? Um, it takes a nonprofit, so you need to have somebody that is running a pit bull. Who has the pit bulls, okay? Because that is somebody that started up a program. So let me give you an example. Um, when I told you guys that I run SOAR Wildlife, I can't tell you how many times I went driving around to go pick up a fawn and people would go, oh, I'd love to have your job. And I went, really, my job? Well, let me tell you about my job. It's all volunteer. It took me about four years to get, meaning I had to volunteer at Wildlife Images 20 hours a week. And oh, by the way, I live about an hour and a half from Wildlife Images. So let me add up all the gas to drive out there, plus 20 hours a week volunteering to learn. And then I had to build my facility at my cost. And then, oh, I have to buy all the formula for these animals. You get where I'm going? So it takes the person to become a nonprofit to train these pit bulls to provide this service who then contacts the warden of this prison and then the person has to become a nonprofit oh did i tell you that i became a nonprofit i couldn't afford to hire a lawyer to do it because it was a lot of money so i started luckily we have google so i typed in how to become a nonprofit and that took about a year to go through the paperwork to become a nonprofit because you have to be a nonprofit. You just can't go in there and go, oh, I wanna do this. You have to become a business and then you have to file all this stuff with the secretary of the state. And then if all these things align and then you have to get approved, you have to come with a program and say, hey, I can't, you just can't say, hey, my name is Tiffany and I wanna come into your prison and no, you have to have a plan. You have to come up with a plan. You have to say, this is what I want to do. You have to have a business proposal. You have to have shown that it works. So you have to be doing it something, somewhere, be doing something somewhere. So if all these um, align, these puzzle pieces, like I told you, align, and the warden says yes, and you're a nonprofit, and you, and you have the time and the money to take off to do this, or you're working somewhere and you have the time to do this, um, then 
that's how you're able to offer. That's why these pit bull programs aren't in every prison. You start to see that because how many people are there out there that are able to have nonprofits and go into every prison and do this? So they're amazing. So I, I, I give this out to all of you out there in the world, to all of you listening to this recording. How many of you want to make a difference? How many of you want to go out in the world someday and say, okay, I may not have the time today, but someday I want to do something. I want to give back in the rehabilitation world because I know there's not the money to do this in every prison, but someday I want to do this. I Maybe it's not with a pit bull, but maybe it's with this and I want to do this and I'm going to start my own nonprofit and I maybe I can't hit every prison, but I'm going to go where I live and do this. That's what I did with wildlife, right? I helped it in Ashland. I didn't help every animal, but I made a difference where I was. So what are you going to do in your little piece? Can you imagine if we all did that in our own little piece of the world? So, so I make that challenge to you in your own little piece of the world to do your little difference if we all did that. So that's how that works. Um, and, and I say we do that in our own little way of however we can do that. And that's how we make a difference. I always get students that ask me, how do we change something? How do we make it? That's how you do it in your own little way. Um, and I started off class today by showing you a video of how not, you know, how to change your world and study something every day for 10 minutes, challenge yourself in doing something different. And so I'm going to challenge you at the end of class today by saying, make a future goal to give something back and make a difference. Okay. So what I want to do is offer some extra credit. I'm not going to tell you how much Just send me an email and tell me what your future goal is going to be to give something back. Okay. So what is your, I've already told you what my future goal. I was a cop. I gave a lot back um, in my daily job, but that was my job and I got paid for it. So I didn't count that. So I moved to Ashland and I continued to work as a professor, but I gave something back with my wildlife sanctuary. That's what I did to volunteer. So what's going to be your future goal someday with something you do? Start thinking about that. And you may never do it, but I want you to start thinking about that. Send me an email for some extra credit and let me know what you're going to do. All right. Um, Thursday, we are going to have class. Since we don't meet next week, we do have community corrections, which I think is really important. That's where we get into the rehabilitation portion of corrections, which I, I think corrections doesn't exist without rehabilitation. I think it's so, so important. And I know we don't have classes next week. And we don't have an assignment. So I think it's so important that that we cover it on Thursday. So we will be meeting on Thursday. We will be covering chapter nine on Thursday. Um, any questions about today and what we covered? All right. I will see everybody on Thursday. Bye, you guys. Thank you. Thank you.